So good morning, everybody. For those who joined um, the last clinical update grand rounds, we did offer CME credit for that event. Um, moving forward, we're excited to say that the, this will be an enduring credit. Um, so you'll be able to view this online and receive credit uh, both uh, for the live activity and uh, for the recording. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen so we can uh, move to introductions. Tom? Great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, John. And thank you for joining us and listening in today. Very excited. It is World Hepatitis Day, at least it was yesterday. So I think it's a very appropriate conversation. We have a lot of guests with us to talk about um, you know, hepatitis. Uh, we have Dr. Vela Caputi, who is uh, from Infectious Disease Assistant Professor at CHI Creighton. Uh, at Bergen Mercy. Um, she started HIV hepatitis and PrEP clinics at her institution and currently serves as program director for ID fellowship at Creighton University. We have Dr. Mindrew, who is an attending at the VA Medical Center, Michael E. DeBakey in Houston, where she's an assistant professor at the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, she did do her internal medicine residency at a Yale program in Connecticut. She also has her infectious disease uh, training at Creighton and transplant from University of Nebraska. Last but not least, we have our fearless leader of population health, Dr. Nick Stein, who's a primary care doctor trained in internal medicine from Brigham and Women's. Um, he did his clinical work at Penn and uh, has his, um, where else? Oh, graduated from Dartmouth undergrad. Anyway, Dr. Stein serves as the senior vice president for Pop Health for Common Spirit Health. And I know he has a strong passion about identifying and treating hepatitis C. So I'm excited to hear from everybody today. So I think first up we have Dr. Uh, Bella Caputi, is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank yeah. you for uh, being here. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, with no delays, I would start. So like Dr. Megan mentioned, it was World Hepatitis Day yesterday and uh, uh, me and Dr. Mindu are glad to talk about uh, who needs to be screened and uh, who should? Um, what is the importance of screening? And Dr. Mindu will take over and talk about the treatment options and considerations. Neither of us has any conflicts of interest and we are not discussing any off-label drug use. So uh, a little bit about the burden of the disease, why we talk so much about screening and treating it. That is because the cases are increasing. It, it's an RNA virus that can cause both acute and chronic hepatitis C. Um, both acute and chronic cases are increasing. And as you can see, the, the facts that I bolded, it's the most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma and indication for liver transplantation in the United States. Rather, uh, the two uh, things I want to emphasize here is not just being the most common cause, it's the it's a preventable cause, it's a treatable cause. That's why we emphasize so much on screening for it and treating it. Let's look at who are at risk and uh, how the epidemiology has changed recently, because this has a very important bearing on why we do universal screening rather than risk-based screening. So as you can see, people, younger people are getting more affected. It's no longer the birth cohort screening that will get, get let you screen uh, all the people because 1945 to 1965, the people born during that birth cohort, yes, they are at high risk for hepatitis C, but if you look at the most recent, I know the statistics are lagging behind by few years, uh, because of the pandemic, but if you see, even if you see in 2019, the most affected age group is 30 to 39 years age group, um, and males are uh, more affected than females. American Indian or Alaska Native race is more affected, although the deaths are more in uh, whites or Caucasians, the incidence was higher in American Indian or Alaska Natives, and uh, the lower uh, right quadrant is something I want you to focus on. The single most or the predominant risk factor that led to increase in hepatitis C incidence in younger population is injection drug use. It accounted for 67% of the cases. And when you look at the incidence and death rates, 
they don't differ much by the gender. Males are more affected and males are more likely to die. Uh, but if you look at the race, there is a uh, difference between the incidence and death rates. As I told earlier, American Indian or Alaskan natives are more affected, but whites are the ones uh, who are more likely to die. So a little bit about the transmission and risk factors. Uh, we need to know, uh, this is something we can use to counsel our patients, how, uh, to educate them how it is spread because they can, they can uh, prevent those things that will put them at risk of reinfection even after they're treated. And they need to know how they can, um, what they can do to prevent it, uh, prevent from giving it to their loved ones. So the transmission is mainly through exposure to blood uh, or vertical transmission, mother to child, through sex and household contact. This is something patients ask me very commonly in my clinic encounters. Uh, so the documented cases that were transmitted through household contact is extremely low, uh, but this can happen if the most common way this happens is by sharing a razor or toothbrush because there is a microabrasion somewhere and the blood is infected blood is coming in contact with that microabrasion then coming to who are at risk so if you look at the topmost one uh, the terminology now is recreational drug use not injection drug use anymore because it's not just by injecting drugs it can be by smoking or inhaling drugs also you can get it male gender, low family income, um, high school, uh, low educational status, high school education or, or less, 10 lifetime sexual partners, one third of the prisoners tested positive for HCV in one of the studies, and uh, people who received blood products prior to 1992 or people who received uh, factor concentrates before 1987, because at that time we didn't know about screening the blood or blood products uh, for hepatitis C. Solid organ transplant recipients, men who have sex with men, uh, and uh, tattoo use, and hemodialysis patients. These are at high risk of uh, getting hepatitis C. But we stopped. Uh, I don't even want you to remember about the 2012 screening guidelines because they are no longer valid. Now it is the the mantra of the day is universal hep C screening. Why did we move to universal hep C screening? The first, the first reason is changing epidemiology. Like I showed you in my previous slides, younger people are more getting infected. So we need to move the screening age to younger age. And the direct antiviral therapy, uh, they are wonderful drugs. You will hear more about them in Dr. Mindru's lecture. They have high cure rate and it's 98% or more cure rate. And the toler they're very tolerable drugs. Uh, I hear from my veteran patients that they left out of the infusion clinics when hep C was treated with interferons because the treatment was worse than the disease. They didn't tolerate it but those days are gone. None of us need to deal with that. Now it's just one pill once a day for 12 weeks or three pills once a day for eight weeks. And they're very tolerable, 98% cure rates. And uh, they're very low cost because there are multiple oral drugs now. So there is competition and the price lowered so much. And their formulary for state Medicare, Medicaid and all commercial insurances. You don't need to bend over backwards or give up your first bond to get a patient hep C treatment. Those days are gone. It's much easier to get them. And uh, potential public health benefit. So every case we treat is another hundreds or thousands of cases we are preventing. So it, that is the potential public health benefit, treatment as prevention. So, um, so to treat somebody, you should first, first find the disease, right? So that's why screening is important. And across all the societies, CDC, United States Preventive Service Task Force, and American, Society, American Association for Society of Liver Disease, and IDSA, all the societies recommend universal screening at least one time for adults between ages 18 and 79 and 
during the pregnancy and some population need periodic screening. But at least everybody in this age group, if you look at the uh, this recommendation from USPS task force, 18 to 79, regardless of their risk, I don't care what their, uh, their risks are, what a race they are, what ethnicity they are, what's their income, nothing matters if they are in that age, you screen them for hepatitis C at least once. And this is because unless we screen, we, we can diagnose, unless we can diagnose, we can treat them. And it's a disservice to our patient population if we are leaving a curable disease untreated. I repeat, it's a curable disease. It's not a suppressible disease like HIV or Hep B, like where you, they start with a pill and they die with a pill. This is definitive treatment. They start with a pill and in eight or 12 weeks, they're treated and they, you re remove the risk of zero, um, HCC or liver, liver transplantation from their life. Then uh, I want you to focus a little bit on the second and uh, second box. So one-time hepatitis screening, regardless of age or setting prevalence among persons with recognized risk factors of or exposures. So the ones with risk factors, you do them and there are people who need periodic screening if you look at the next box. So those are the people who use recreational drugs or share needles, syringes or drug pre preparation equipment. Uh, or persons with selected medical conditions, including persons or who ever received hemodialysis or who continue to be on hemodialysis. They need periodic screening. And the last point, I want you to focus on it. Anybody who asks for it, because at the first encounter, you are nobody to the patient. You didn't establish that rapport with them. So there might be risk factors. They are not ready yet to uh, disclose with you because they didn't develop that rapport with you. So anybody who asks for it, you screen them. And it's a simple blood test. So uh, a little bit about the progression. So out of eight uh, people, 100 people exposed, 85% develop chronic infection. Only 15 to 25 um, spontaneously clear it. So, but majority, 85% develop chronic infection. Out of them, up to 20% 20 in 20, 20 years will progress to cirrhosis. And out of those who develop cirrhosis, there is an annual risk of uh, one to 4% that they will progress to liver failure or hepatocellular carcinoma. That's what we are trying to prevent by treating screening early and treating the disease early. So how do we screen? So we screen, uh, we start with the antibody. Uh, it gets detectable within four to 10 weeks after infection, and it's present in more than 97% of the people by six months after exposure. Patients who clear infection will still have the hepatitis C antibody, and who clear it doesn't need treatment because their body spontaneously cleared it. The next step in screening is the viral load, where you measure the HCV RNA copies. So RNA, it becomes detectable much quicker two to three weeks after infection, you, they, it gets to detectable levels. And that is the one that confirms the chronic infection. So the basics of screening, the screening test should be something that picks up majority of the cases easily available and available in all the settings. Something we use should be applicable in a rural place in Montana to Man Manhattan, New York. So it should be available to everybody. So that's why we choose a simple and widely available test and a cheaper test. So you always start with antibody, but a screening test has all should always be confirmed by a confirmatory test. Otherwise, you will fall into the trap of false positives or false negatives. So that's why an antibody should be followed by a viral load, which, which will confirm the diagnosis of hepatitis C and will help you make the treatment decisions. So uh, if you look at the linkage to care, so you start with antibody. If it's non-reactive and they, do, they have no risk factors, you stop there. But if it is reactive, you do the viral load. If it is not detected, that means they don't have a current infection or they cleared it or it's a false positive antibody. But if it is detected by the viral load, you link them to care. When I say linkage to care, depending on which setting you are, 
there are infectious disease physicians like me who treat hepatitis C, and there are GI doctors who treat hepatitis C. Um, you can refer to whoever is available in the system. And the, uh, the only other difference is if the patient has decompensated cirrhosis or advanced liver failure, it's better to uh, for them to be in the hands of a hepatologist or a gastroenterologist rather than an infectious disease doctor because they need much more than antiviral therapy. Uh, why do we talk so much about cure? Because cure decreases transmission and cure is shown to improve clinical outcomes. Not just the hepatic outcomes like decreasing cirrhosis, decompensation, hepatocellular carcinoma, transplantation. Also the all-cause mortality, they, it improves quality of life, decreases the malignancy incidence, di better diabetes control, low risk of, decreases their risk of cardiovascular disease, renal issues, and new, the, it improves their neurocognitive capabilities too. That's why it's very important to screen and treat and cure this curable disease. And I stop here and uh, I would like to uh, like to invite Dr. Mindru to take over to talk about the treatment options. Thank you everyone for your patient listening. Uh, I'm Cesare Namendru, I live in Houston. So uh, thank you Dr. Vela Gapudi for this wonderful intro. I would like to remind the audience that um, nowadays, and this was shown by Dr. El Sarag, uh, who is our chairman of medicine in Baylor College, and he has a wonderful uh, colleague, Dr. Conwell. Um, the hepatitis C is not longer number one reason uh, for treatment. There was a clear decrease in the number of HCC in the veteran population, which was uh, also um, confirmed by uh, in non-VA population in real life. So it's common, still common, more common than we want, this hepatitis C. It's curable, more than 95% uh, in terms of uh, cure. Um, some drugs advertise 100%, it depends. It's easy to treat and the shortest um, treatment is eight weeks for three pills a day. And I would like to emphasize this. For the primary care physician who wants to treat, they have the knowledge, the time, the support to treat. They could. And there is a nice study coming from 2016 that showed even in very complicated setting, urban health centers, you have a lot of 23% HIV co-infected, 20% uh, with cirrhosis, and some already treatment experience. The sustained virologic response uh, 12 weeks after the ending the treatment, which means cure, was overall 86%. Doesn't matter if the treatment was done by a PCP, a mid-level, or a specialist. So uh, it can be done at the level of PCP. This is a simplified hepatitis C treatment algorithm that the ones who feel comfortable with that can consult at their own leisure and apply to the guidelines. I'm not going to talk about that, but essentially for simplified agement, you can use glecaprevir, pipetrasvir, also known as Maviret commercial or Sofosbuvir, Velpatasvir, which is Epclusa. I, I treated thousands of people and over the past nine years, I thought the primary care physician um, brought good valid questions to us. And I would like to address a couple of them and uh, maybe relieve some of your uh, anxieties. One that comes pretty often is the low risk or so-called low risk um, patient who comes, for example, this lady born in 1967. So that's after 1965. She is healthy. She has a wonderful social life. She has no self-reported factors for hepatitis C. She's a solid citizen of the community are you going to offer hepatitis C screening? Because you, you might believe you offend this person by inferring she did something wrong. 
Absolutely. Because in retrospect, when you look at the self-reported factors and for people who are positive with chronic hepatitis C, which means positive PCR, you'll see a lot of people do not report an exposure. So again, um, maybe a lapse in judgment 25 years ago for 10 minutes or using the same razor in a fraternity house that can or sorority house then cap uh, then happen. Another one is the hesitance of screening um, in patients who have too many comorbidities. The primary care physicians are essentially swamped with all the reminders, vaccinations, lipid, hep, uh, you know, target hemoglobin A1C, et cetera. I've been there, done that. So when you find a patient that's complicated, it seems overwhelming. So I'm giving you a case of an elderly gentleman who was diagnosed with some uh, new Hodgkin lymphoma, which in the past was clearly associated with hepatitis C. And he just has the antibody pasta without a reflex PCR. You know, his oncologist wants to treat uh, with chemo and maybe rituximab. A patient is in great uh, functional shape, has a couple of medication, one of them being statin exam, you know, couple of lymph nodes. And you see on the CT abdomen and pelvis, you have mildly enlarged spleen, which uh, also strikes fear for cirrhosis, right? Normal liver. And if you look at the enzymes, uh, ALT, uh, LTST, low platelets, normal albumin and are normal. And uh, creatinine mildly elevated, you're like, oh, this is absolutely complicated. This guy has cirrhosis, I don't want to deal with it. And for the people who don't feel comfortable, it's perfect to refer. Refer after you confirm this guy has hepatitis C with a PCR. So PCPs are the gatekeepers and they are essential for expediting treatment. So the, the minimal workup is to find out the genotype, makes a difference and also even if I can treat without the genotype, it will be nice if they get reinfected to find out what genotype they were at baseline. If they ever got any treatment for hepatitis C, the most complicated one in practice is to determine the level of fibrosis. That will help us tailor the treatment duration and option. And if you have high fibrosis, you refer to hepatology for linkage into care and um, screening for hepatitis C, sorry, for HCC, for hepatoma. So at the primary care level, medication, all of them, herbal supplements, prescribed, um, recreational, et cetera. Use is not important for approving or denying the treatment that you have to establish a baseline for the patient. Um, we talked about genotype, HIV status, regular labs, included INR. Very important, the hepatitis B virus serology has to be checked, not in this patient with lymphoma who will get maybe rituximab, but in everybody, because every single medication has a black box warning about positivity. And um, core antibody isolated, you um, follow, surface antigen you follow. If they have a viral load, a hepatitis B viral load that requires more specialized care in somebody who can treat. Because you treat hep C, you'll get a flare of hep B and you can get somebody in liver failure. The imaging, very important. Um, and that has been a, you know, a pain for our primary care physician because if you get a radiologist reading uh, evidence of cirrhosis, but they don't say anything about the portal vein um, size or that is normal, no splenomegaly. Oh, this is cirrhosis. This cirrhosis or high fibrosis is not a diagnostic, uh, is not diagnosed by ultrasound and by CT. And we'll get into that. And uh, a good workup includes labs to rule out uh, underlying liver disease, such as autoimmune hepatitis, hemochromatosis, Wilson. They are easy to find. The non-invasive method to assess fibrosis changed the um, picture, the landscape. 
the most useful that I find in clinical practice for quick decision is FIB4. Fibrosure has, is very good if it's very high or very low, but can be tormented by all other things. It's a concoction of proprietary, um, includes bilirubin, globulin, et cetera. Fibroscan is the best, but not everybody has access. To get, the, to get a relief from primary care thinking, they might want to try this. The best interaction drug checker is by far University of Liverpool. Let's, going back, let's go back to the fibrosis. The one that I told you, FIB4 index, which is in patient happens to be 7.5, has an area under the curve compared with F4. F4 is high fibrosis, F0 is non fibrosis, of 0 0.86. So 86% of the people with high FIB4 have um, cirrhosis. It's good as a negative predictive value. If it's low, it's good, it rules out. Fibrosure about the same. I put it there for your enjoyment. Elastography is exceptional for negative uh, predictive value and is not that expensive. Of course, the gold standard is MRI with MRI elastography, which is very expensive, very long, and usually is uh, requested by hepatology. Like in this case, you're unsure, you have some enlarged spleen, you have um, a high FIB4, you don't know what's going on, so that will be a good one. But if his elastography is good, you're not going to go to um, elastography. I mean, fibroscan versus MRI. Another case scenario, you know, have young people who are interested in STD clinic, they are sometimes on pre-exposure prophylaxis because they are at risk of achieving HIV, they have open relationships. So the questions are like, well, if I'm diagnosed with acute or chronic hepatitis C, how likely is to transmit to the partner? Will I be able to donate plasma or blood? And also because of the explosion of this chem sex, um, which is a concoction of um, GABA and Viagra and Mephedrone and methamphetamine to enhance pleasure and the duration of sexual activity, especially in networks like social networks and those applications that you heard about. Um, is this a contraindication to treatment? And as a part of the lifestyle, irregular schedule, flying, et cetera, was the chance for cure. And um, PCP is essential for cure, for uh, education and advice. Uh, that they are the gatekeeper. Of course, in this patient, there is a good chance of transmission because the sex is often non-protected, there are multiple partners, uh, use of PrEP and STDs already increase the risk. Unlike the heterosexual couples in a monogamous relationship where the transmission is almost unheard of. He can never donate blood, not only because of high risk MSM and injected drug, but let's, let's say in 10 years from now, He's treated, doesn't have a viral um, load, is still blood bank will not accept it. And would the recreational drug use be a contraindication? It depends on insurance on the state. But if we scale up and retreat as many people as we can in this micro environment, the micro environment, uh, we can use treatment as prevention. This is an older slide, but I think it's fascinating because in my practice, I had people who were uh, cured after seven days of uh, ledipasvir, sohosbuvir, um, two weeks of uh, glecapresvir, pibetrasvir, because they were lost to follow up or something happened. And you have the shock when you call them back, um, they are undetectable, they are considered cured. On the other side, you have a couple of those. This is not 100% who diligently took the medication, no PPI, no nothing, and they are still not cured. So this slide is essential. The, in the people who have predictors or non-adherence, like alcohol, uh, cirrhosis, uh, kidney, and genotype three, you still could achieve a high cure, even with 50% adherence rate. And it's nicely shown 
So uh, don't uh, withhold the treatment just because these people are yeah. unlikely to take it. So again, even low adherence results in cure. For the next two slides, that's only for the primary care because I'm probably out of time and there is no way I can discuss treatment of this disease in 14 um, minutes or 16. Um, I think it will be good just to have them uh, for follow-up. Of course, they are available in uh, American Liver Association. And uh, thank you. Thank you, that's great. Um, we're gonna, let's see here, right here's Tom. Yep. Um, one, one thing I, uh, thank you both, absolutely great and uh, lots of information and we'll be sure the slides get out to folks. We're gonna transition to the um, panel and I think if we could start, uh, Nick, I know you've got some, you have a stake in this and I wanna, wanna just kind of get your impression and then uh, we'll see if we've got questions and so forth. Sure. <laughs> thanks, Gary. And um, thanks for those great presentations. It's uh, one of the real great things about being the size that we are is we have we have experts in to really help us dig in deep to so many areas that that matter very broadly. But um, but it's really great to hear straight from you guys and the latest on on some of the science and how it has evolved. You know, this is a field that has evolved so much over the past decade. Um, really uh, doesn't really bear much resemblance to when when we most of us trained and remember the horror days of interferon and um, low cure rates and just feeling like you know you don't call that having a cure for for a disease and just the way that uh, the direct acting antivirals have have changed that and and really liberalized who and how to deliver this um, their costs which were initially prohibitive in a lot of cases have come down significantly. Um, you know, this is everything you guys said in your openings about, you know, this is, there's just a lot coming together in this clinical situation that as clinicians and leaders is really exciting, really curable, um, devastating disease, uh, very prevalent globally and locally, it affects our most vulnerable patients. Um, and we have everything we need to eradicate it, you know, um, we're a ways from that, but I think the um, the more we learn about care models that are effective for this, how to do them, how to do them safely, um, leveraging the uses of care teams, uh, continue to feel like this is just a, such a ripe opportunity for common spirit to, to come together and do something together that we couldn't do on our own and really lead nationally and uh, getting toward those eradication goals and in ways that are really, you know, a lot of things that we do that are as uh, irreversible is cure. Um, you know, it's a lot of chronic disease management we do in primary care, a lot of prevention. And so I think there's just a lot that is exciting. And I think it makes us all kind of feel connected to that reason we get up in the morning and get into this this kind of work. So um, we're excited about that. I know a lot of other uh, national teams are and local teams as well. Um, if you do have existing programs, we should be aware of. We're doing sort of an updated scan of, uh, of, of what's out there. We know there's great work happening in a lot of different uh, markets that we have, please reach out to us. I think there'll be some contact info in the follow-up here. Um, if you'd like to add your expertise or help champion in, in, in your division, um, obviously it's a it's a difficult environment for new projects, but we know that if we can really get a good look at the at the financial ROI and make our case, the, the mission case is really, really strong here. And one other thing to note is while the science is as you know, we've learned a lot about you know not necessarily needing to look at certain restrictions, whether it's about providers or patients. Um, not all states have caught up with that, so we have a lot of huge variation in state policy and restrictions and prior offs and things like that. So we're going to try to help navigate that to the extent that uh, varies across our markets. But I think we have some some good folks trying to pull some pieces together on that and. Uh, I think it's a shared shared enthusiasm for what what's possible here. So really appreciate you guys bringing your expertise, and um, really interested to hear more about what is going on out there in in the markets, either through questions or in follow up. Great, thanks. Um, I, I have one question, Dr. Mindrew. I just want to be sure I heard you right, and I think what you said is, um, it's great to treat one patient, but keep in mind. That when you do, you, I think you said you're removing a hand, a hundred patients out of a thousand uh, who would be susceptible or would eventually get hepatitis C from a public health standpoint. And did I 
it was i think that's what i heard but i wanted just to i don't think i understand the the question i don't think you have to remove anybody universal screening and once you have the pcr you go and get it treat so I, I might not understand the question well i, I think i think it was that um it, it, in terms of if the patient is untreated how many cases would we expect out of a thousand patients i do not know that's an epidemiologic question all we know okay. is that uh if you have and that was a great uh, amsterdam study mosaic uh, in um, um, male having sex with men uh, who are on PrEP. And we know the prevalence in the patients with high risk versus the one who actually had similar risk, but were not on PrEP was 8% versus 2.8%. So in the general population, there is no telling, um, especially now with the uh, with COVID, they have put things on hold and we are behind. Number two, with the explosion and sexual networks that, um, you know, they are coexisting with STD. Do you have multiple opportunities to distinguish this microenvironment? They've mm -hmm. done that again in Amsterdam, in patients who are hep C and HIV co-infected. And the, the rate, they, they addressed the network, the rate of cure was around 90%. Okay. I think there was another point you made that was really striking of for every, for every patient that we cure, we prevent some certain amount of downstream transmission uh, or infections. Was there a number that you said? I, I didn't say a number. Okay. It's, uh, you know, in the population, you re, in high risk population, for example, um, you decrease it, you know, fourfold. That's an epidemiologic data, and I'm not sure how accurate they are because we're lagging behind. But it, now we're going to see a ton of patients uh, who are newly diagnosed. I think one of the striking things to me, a theme that's come across both in screening and in the treatment has been sort of the partnership between physicians as well as APPs, right? So our advanced practice providers and how each of us have as a role to play when it comes to both screening and treatment. I would love if you guys could expand on how you've sort of had that interdisciplinary team in your respective clinical settings. So I at Creighton uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, we, we do have, uh, for infectious disease, it's mostly the uh, physicians treating. Um, but in GI, we do have APPs uh, who do treat. And uh, like uh, in the study Dr. Mindu showed, the cure rates are uh, almost same. But if a patient has decompensated cirrhosis, or if they have a co-infection like HIV or Hep B, they're better off in the physician's hands because the drug interactions and all that, those parts. Uh, and typically, I would like to emphasize one more thing about the team. Uh, I feel like most of the times, um, the physician burnout is from documentation or the dealing with the paperwork and uh, getting the, filling the patient assistance forms or, un, or those things. For those, our pharmacy, uh, like at CHI, we send it to St. Joe Speciality Pharmacy and we have a medication access coordinator who uh, looks up the patient insurance and sees what is the formulary drug and uh, do they pay even if the patient has a positive drug screen within the six months because Medicaid doesn't pay if, without a negative drug screen, but everybody else don't care if their patient has a drug positive drug screen or not. So that's something I thought I would like to share with the group because that might really help uh, facilitate the physician workflow, having a medication access coordinator who is a pharmacy tech. They don't need to be a full-fledged pharmacist, just a pharmacy tech who will remove all those barriers. And uh, uh, she does the free copay, uh, she does apply for those copay cards when patient get, takes it to the pharmacy, it's zero cost for the patient. So um, yeah, 
so sorry, your question was about APPs and the physicians. Yes, we do have APPs treating in GI clinics, but ID it's mostly physicians at our campus. All right, great. Uh, there, there's one comment and then we'll wrap up um, in the chat. And I, I, th I think it's a theoretical question and it's, is it possible to add hepatitis C in the order set of admitted patients to our system? And, and I, I think it's, the question is, has there been any thoughts about that? Are any systems doing it? I guess would be the other way to ask the question. Um, so one of our faculty at Creighton, Dr. Ilhat, is leading a QI project uh, based on this. To That way we can promote universal screening. Um, so we would really appreciate if there are any system-wide measures that can be put in place to encourage this measure. Uh, we, uh, I, I think the idea was not perceived right when we presented it, um, but um, I mean, that, I think that would be a great way to screen um, all the people that needs the screening and we would appreciate any support at the system level to make that happen. Or if you want to try like a pilot thing at one site first. I don't know whether Epic allows that. That's beyond my expertise. Maybe I have to ask the IT folks, but or can we can choose a pilot site and uh, see what it results in and then apply system-wide. I think that's a great idea. More to come Epic on. adds quickly on yes. this. What it was done uh, in our institution, it was replacement of all the orderable lab tests with hepatitis C viral load with reflex. So if that was positive, the lab will automatically do the viral load. So that was the change and nothing else could have been ordered. Nothing, no quantitative, quantitative, et cetera, et cetera. That was just lab and the system and has been done. All right, um, that's great. Uh, the, I just wanted to note, and we will send this out to all the participants, uh, there's a comment from Samantha Ross. If you're interested in connecting with the team, exploring a possible system-wide approach, please reach out to Hannah Burns Enoch. Is that right, Nick? I have that comment. Yeah, Hannah, so, Hannah Burns Enoch. And also, if you have a, a program in place that, that we should be aware of that's doing uh, great work, we know there's a lot of those out there and uh, of different shapes and sizes. So uh, we want to be able to, to, to know everything we're working with and tap in all that expertise. So please uh, please do reach out. So um, thank, um, I would like to thank, first of all, our guests, um, uh, Dr. Mindru and Dr. Velika Pudi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, th I think this is just eye opening. So we really appreciate it. And, and Nick, for your leadership and spurring us on in this, this efforts and Dr. Sagar for bringing this to the Clinical uh, Standards and Variation Reduction Committee. I think there's lots of positives that will come from this. Uh, I think we're just starting the journey and it's a great opportunity. So uh, we really appreciate uh, the thought and effort that you both put into this and, and So with that, um, uh, we say thanks. Uh, this will be uh, come out uh, probably next week and we hope that you'll share it with your colleagues. We usually get uh, several multiples of folks listening to it than um, uh, we have in person. So again, thank you. There's a CME credit to be sure to, um, text into and uh, I think we're set. So I hope everybody has a safe weekend and uh, a great day.